and we're here with Mr. Matthew Sharp from the Rental. How's it going? It's going very well. How are you doing? Pretty well, thanks. Uh, how's the tour going so far? Uh, well, this is the first night of the East Coast run, which is three shows, and our West Coast run was three shows. So it's not really a tour as much as it is like little kind of one-offs or something like that. Yeah, like a little break in between. Yeah, it's, well, it's funny, like we did a show in L.A., and then uh, uh, the couple nights later, we did a show right outside of LA, in a little in a little town. And then I was at the um, meeting people after the show and just saying hello to some of the followers and uh, supporters and stuff like that. And somebody said, "Well, good luck on the rest of the tour." And I'm like, "The rest of the tour is tomorrow night." And that's like, <laughs> like that kind of thing. So um, they, you know, they're over before they start, kind of thing. That's what it feels like. Oh, so it's like a divided into two big parts, like two the, very small parts. Yeah. Well, yeah. The well, in terms of the land, yeah, the West Coast and East Coast. Yeah. So, um, speaking of the tour, mm -hmm. um, how did you get with, uh, you know, the Keith from Weird Scientists and Sean from Starfucker in your live band. Um, well, uh, Sean really is, uh, I mean, he got involved through Polyvinyl essentially. Um, when Polyvinyl would come to LA to, to listen to, um, the Rentals album and sort of check in with me and those kind of things, uh, we'd go out for drinks or dinner or something like that. And, Sean would be there with uh, his bandmates, and we just became friends through that. And then when it came time to do some shows, and we were looking for a bass player, the people at Polyvinyl said, "Hey, what about Sean?" I, you know, I was like, "Hell yeah, if he's interested in doing it, you know." Uh, so it was just, it was just that kind of thing, you know. And also, someone still loves you, Bart Elton, through Polyvinyl. Yeah, a lot of well, a lot of that. You know, we wanted to initially. Uh, at least I I wanted to do something where it was like, um, like uh, all these different people from polyvinyl touring together and do a big polyvinyl touring kind of thing, and then uh, at the end of it, sort of have it culminate with a rental show where everybody from all these different polyvinyl bands kind of come together and just make up the rental. So it had been like the Dodos and, and of Montreal and Starfucker and Boris Yeltsin and. You know, all these different people just sort of like playing on one big show together and then just have us all kind of do one big thing at the, at the end. That's kind of presumptuous of me to think that like we should be at the end of that situation or whatever, but the music that we make kind of that works for, for that sort of, um, feeling or whatever, that collective, uh, sort of cel celebratory thing. Um, but we couldn't figure out how to to do it with scheduling everything and getting all the bands in the same cities at the same time, all where they're, you know, whatever, not on tour on their own or making records on their own or doing whatever. So, um, we ended up doing these shows where it's got some of that spirit, um, like where we're having Boris Yeltsin play with us tonight and, uh, in the next couple nights, uh, and then like Keith from We Are Scientists and, um, Ryan from Ozma and, uh, Sean and Lauren and Adele and all these people coming together to do the shows and that's why the the tours are so short because sort of all the stars have to align yeah. you know like I don't know whatever everybody just has to be like right in the right place like we're scientists are doing shows I think out here um, in a couple of weeks I think but yeah, like, yeah, they yeah. had this yeah, little her blood. Yeah, so he had this little window where he's like, okay, I'm not doing anything from this time to this time. It's like, okay, let's go, you know, and then, yeah. but then right before you're about to say yes, you gotta go, oh, Sean, are you okay? Are you in? You know, whatever. And then, yeah. so he ended up flying here from wherever they, wherever Starfucker ended their tour. I think it was in Vancouver or something like that. And then, like, flies out here and then he, like, comes, does a couple shows with us, flies back to, to Portland to do his thing. And then, um, like Lauren, who plays viola with us, and she plays synthesizer and sings with us. She's been like the longest active rentals kind of member. She plays in this um, group called the Section Quartet, and they do the they play on all kinds of records and things and whatever TV shows. Are. And so she's probably the busiest of all of us. And so every little everything just has to just go. Okay, everybody's got that window right right then. You know? Let's get right into uh, the making of uh, Lost in Alphaville. 
Sure. Um, so, I have a quote here for you. Okay. In quote, I just love that son of a bitch. Who, who, whom do you think you are describing here? Carney. Yeah, Pat Carney. Yeah. So, how much, <laughs> so how much do you think Pat Carney influenced the album in, in terms of the drums? And, I mean, I, I realized that I kind of, uh, the drum, the drum track in, uh, what was the song? Oh, yeah, yeah. Drum track in one of the songs reminded me of the drum track from, uh, Dead and Gone, uh, uh-huh. by the Black Keys. Yeah, Traces of Our Tears, that, you yeah, the drum track reminded me a lot of that. Just, I, I just, yeah, I you just know, like, raw, Pat Carney feeling. You know, he, I mean, he plays the way he plays, you know, I think that the weird thing that was, uh, for him is that when the Black Keys make records, they just, it's just those two guys, and they're in a room, and it kind of starts either from Dan or from him, and, it, and he just plays a groove, and they kind of make something off of whatever, whatever he's feeling. And this was, a different thing because he was coming in when he was one of the last parts of the record. He was like the second to last thing on the record. The girls from Lucius were the very last part of it, but um, he was right at the end. So there, we'd already sort of figured out like uh, like the structures of the songs and the kind of just overall feeling or whatever. And then he was coming in. Uh, at the very end of that, and even saying that, he changed, when, once he became involved with it, it changed everything. But it, but it was a different experience, I believe, you'd have to ask him, but it was a different ex- experience for him because it wasn't, it wasn't starting from him, you know? So it was like, oh, well, what does this song need? There's already vocals and strings and things and synthesizers and all this stuff already in there. And so he had to like figure out how could he fit into it. Um, but when, once he got in there, uh, I said this a lot in different things, but I mean, I, I just had the record in, uh, definitely a more kind of, uh, uh, precious sort of place. And then when he came and got involved, he just started knocking shit over a little bit, like, no, like, boom, you know, and like, and, and in a, in a in a gr- in a great way, in a way that the record needed, and, and I needed to get like uh, I needed to get knocked around a little bit myself, and and uh, and lose some of that uh, control a little bit, and it also just made things more aggressive and exciting, and and uh, he's just a cool son of a bitch. That's all there is to it. <laughs> you know, he just is. You know, it's like um, he like out of everybody that worked worked on this record, I could say with like in a definitive way that he was the person with the least um, um, amount of time to think about if he wanted to be involved or not. He was just, from the moment I asked him, he was like, yes, get on a plane tomorrow. You know, so it was just like we went from talking about doing the record to like a second later. I was on the plane and on my way to Nashville, we'd never met each other. So and so he had no hesitation and everybody else, not to say that they were like really hemming and hawing about it or thinking about it, but they were, you know, whatever was else was going on in their life and how I'm going to make time to do this and all these kind of things. He was like, no, let's go. And, uh, and that was really, that, that alone is a kind of a sign of how, who he is and how he is and, uh, and why I probably said whatever that quote was or whatever, because it was just like, you know, he was there for me from the, the second I asked. I asked for it and, and uh, asked for his help, and and uh, you know, so how cool was that? <laughs> so it just seemed like every collaboration you did, you know, every interaction you had with the people you were collaborating with, it was very personal, I guess, because you know, I heard that it was every single one of them was like one-on-one encounter. Like you went over to uh, meet up with uh, Lucius. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I read that you pretty much like packed your whole studio and then just yeah for sure. And I mean, and my whole studio is very small, so it's not like uh, you know I'm not like with backpacks of equipment and stuff like that. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, now you can just do everything on your laptop and then like. But I did have a particular. Uh, I listened to everything on one pair of speakers, and I wanted to listen when I was playing them the record. It wasn't uh, a certainty that they were going to do it. Uh, I mean, they were both sort of like auditioning each other, or something. <laughs> and that was sort of what it was. Like, are, are we going to connect? Are you, you uh, are you going to feel? I keep rubbing against this wall. It's kind of funny sound for you. Um, 
but uh, you know, whatever. They had, they had to see if they felt like they'd never heard any music. They didn't know what the album was going to sound like. They probably knew very little about the rentals, and and it's not something I don't think that it was really a part of their lives in any way. I had a feeling they're both married. I had a feeling it was maybe their husbands knew more about what <laughs> what the rentals were about than they did, and I think maybe they were kind of encouraging them to do it, which I uh, will be forever thankful to for them for that. Um, but they so they were basically like listening to it, seeing if they were interested at all. And there was probably a when I went to go see them, there was as like it was definitely a fifty fifty situation. I it, there was not a um I didn't really have any sense that they were going to say yes to it. I thought there was a really good chance that they're going to go, no, this isn't really our thing or whatever. I mean, that's what the, the tone of the music isn't exactly what they do with it on their own, but the stuff they've done with like Jeff Tweedy and other people isn't, yeah. that's not exactly what they do on their own either. So, um, but you know, the, the truth is like, I had to also see if they were people that I wanted to be with and, People, I wanted to see if they were like the right, because uh, I did, I knew very little about them except for my like passion for their voices, and so I just had to see like, are you as people the, the people that you want representing this album? Because the album is something we put a lot of care and a lot of love into, and you know, I mean, who knows? Maybe they could have been a couple bitches, you <laughs> yeah. know? I don't know? Like maybe they could have been nasty. Maybe they could have been uh, who knows? Maybe they could have been whatever. Maybe they could have had all kinds of different attitudes maybe they would have who know you just don't know yeah. you know yeah. um, I mean you kind of get the sense that you know them from their voices when they sing and you feel connected with them and you're like I mean how could they be terrible people <laughs> like, listen now they're saying they're, they're like the most they got to be the most lovely people in the world which they were um, and they they the, the way their voices sound are the way they are as people to me and uh, uh, so I got very uh, I was very fortunate for that, and from the moment I played them the first song, which is "It's Time to Come Home," um, like I brought my my little laptop with the with all of the the studio stuff in it, and then my speakers from home, and uh, we got a little room in Manhattan and got to, to play them the album. And the, but the second they uh, were listening, I felt like they were there with me. They were present. They were like cognizant of like what they were listening to and asking the right questions and being skeptical and being and being inquisitive and just being there you know and and that's so basically they had me from that point so it forward. just clicked like well at least for, it did for me in that sense of like you know i had the sense of oh i'm exactly where i need to be this is and uh, then, so then, you know, under the table, you just got your fingers crossed and you're just going like that, right? Yeah. So you're just going, to please let them feel the same way. And, uh, the only question was, they, their record was coming out a week later. So they had, uh, a ton of promotion and they were out, like, doing, like, in stores and concerts and radio stuff and interviews and all this stuff. And they were pretty wiped out and exhausted. And so that even made it, in a sense, even more special because, they took the time yeah. in the midst when they probably just wanted to go home and like whatever, cuddle up with their cats and, <laughs> and nap or whatever, you know, I'm sure that's what they wanted to do, but they took the time out and we made it happen under pretty, uh, pretty crazy whirlwind for them. So you obviously love synthesizers. Yes. And so my question is, when did you first start experimenting with synthesizers? Was it before we there? And also, what are your favorite synthesizers now? Um, well, I mean, all the stuff that that I worked on with since before the Weezer uh, stuff happened, before we became a band, was not cool synthesizer <laughs> stuff. It was like, it was pretty, uh, you know, it's just trying to explore that stuff, but it wasn't cool, vintage old, uh, interesting. I just didn't know anything about it, and I was... And, uh, and I was trying to make music that was really super synthetic and I was into like all this kind of like Thomas Dolby and all this different stuff, but it wasn't what I consider now to be particularly cool, uh, 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 things. But then when, um, and, and so I, I went down that road for a while, but, um, when we were working on 
Return of the Rentals, uh, our first album, the the guy who was producing the record and recording the record had these two old Moog synthesizers there, uh, the, and one of them we still use now, which is the Source, and another one is the, an Opus 3. And they were there in the studio with us, and it was just basically the two of us um, talking about, you know, uh, trying to, whatever, incorporate them in a way that we, that we yeah. wanted to, which was in a very kind of like overt way, like where you really use them as something that's like a pet peeve of mine is that when people use synthesizers, they put them uh, in within the context of rock music, they put them so, it's a textural thing and they just yeah, kind of yeah. put them way back so they're there, but they're not really there. And we didn't want to use them that way. We wanted them to be way up front and be really featured and to be like the main melodic kind of parts of the music. And uh, and that was the one probably aspect of it that we did that people weren't doing a lot of at that particular time. And uh, and you know we were both kind of geeking out on Gary Newman and ELO <laughs> and all these things. And like when uh, Pat uh, from Weezer and I were huge Gary Newman fans, and we would listen to uh, Pleasure Principle and uh, and uh, Replica uh, replicas a lot. And so and we would play like these like odd uh, Gary Newman instrumentals before Weezer would come out on stage and yeah. stuff like that. And so that was just, we were really reverent and he was just somebody we looked up to. So there was some of that in there as well. So I have one last question. For sure. You. So, you know, I was wondering why uh, you decided to, you know, re-record the songs from Songs, songs About Time. I mean, I really, it was really interesting to hear the new versions because, and how they contrasted because the new version sounded much more massive in a way yeah for sure well they're 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 they are that way for a bunch of different reasons um mainly the people that are involved on you know that are in, in the songs they're they're massive because patrick carney's playing drums and they're massive because jess and holly are singing those vocals and they you know i mean if you know their voices they just these beautiful gorgeous massive voices and the guy who mixed the record, um, Dave Sardi, is, you know, whatever. He's, just, he's, he's one of my heroes. So, like, uh, he's just, when I first heard Thought of Sound, um, which is the first song we mixed, like, I thought we were making this big, heavy thing, and I gave it to him. And when it came back, I was just like, oh, my God. Like, that's what it can sound like, just really, like, and I was kind of terrified of it, how large it sounded. And then he, and he was like, yeah, I decided to go for a more subtle approach. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I remember that being very funny. But the reason, um, well, I mean, I'll, this is kind of a long answer, so I don't know if it's going to spill over, but the whole thing with Songs About Time, and Songs About Time was an, uh, an arts project that we were doing, and we used the rental's name uh, to just, because so many people were working on this project, and everybody was like, kind of like coming together, and, and, uh, you know, giving their time to make this big arts project where there's 50, 60 people working on it, people from different countries all over the world sort of contributing to it. And we thought if we used the rental's name for it, it would help bring as much attention as I could bring, which isn't a lot, but it was just like I wanted to make sure that these people's work was somebody who gave it some attention. So it was more of a thought of this isn't, a rentals project, but more like the rentals present this thing, you know? So it's like the rentals present this big arts project and all our friends are coming together to like try to make it happen. And like we're working together on a daily basis. And, and then, well, I'll just say this, like, so like there's a, as far as why we went back to why we recorded these particular songs from, from songs about time, was one thought and that I just discussed with somebody was, I can't remember which author said this, but he basically said, if you write a book and it's not published, then it's not a book. You know, I think it was Norman Mailer, but it, it, it sounds like something you would say, but it's essentially like if you stay at home and you, you know, you have your typewriter and you type out this book and you finish it all and you put the last period on the last sentence of the thing and it's done, you put the title of the book on there, fine. But it's still not a book. It's not a book until it's like legitimately put.
put through like a publishing house and put in stores and has like a, you know, that it's in the public consciousness that way. And with the Songs About Time thing, it's something that we did on our own. We created it on our own. We released it on our own. In a sense, it was never released because it's, or it was never a book. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I wanted to make sure that we did it in a, in that way. So it felt, you know, complete and as a whole and that, you know, that it was a, a legitimate thing. You know? Okay. So wrapping up here, what's Damon Albarn like in, in, in person? Uh, do, you, do you remember at all? Well, I mean, I haven't hung out with him in ages. So I was like, I was a, a much younger man then as, as was he or something, you know. Um, and he was, uh, you know, I mean, honestly, out of all the people that, that came up, uh, at that time and the people that I knew and the people I was interacting with, uh, and the other musicians who I didn't know that were just like the relevant musicians of that time. He, to me, has like run circles around everybody and made everybody look like they're running in slow motion <laughs> because he's just been able to do something that is very, you know, he's been able to just change and try different things and be creative in all kinds of different outlets and be relevant and make music that is, you know, beautiful and sad and dancing and happy and this and that, whatever, all kinds of different things. And, you know, just been able to take a lot of chances and maybe it doesn't all work, but when it hits, it really is special. And so I really have, like, I had a great admiration for him back then, um, but I think I have even more of that now, just seeing all the, the really cool, interesting things he's done and the way that he's like conducted himself and all that stuff is pretty amazing, you know, like, and, uh, and when we were working together, the few things that we did do together, we didn't do a lot, but when we worked together, the thing that is like, just from like a technical standpoint is he's so insanely fast. <laughs> like he sang on Big Daddy C on the second, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. second rentals album. He sang all the vocals in the chorus. And he basically, I got from what I remember, he did it in like 30 minutes, you know. And he came into the studio, was like, okay, like, da, 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 what, what's going on? And he was probably going from one place to another place and like popped in. He was a really sweet, good friend. He took really very good care of me when I was in in England. And then he, you know, as a favor, came down to the studio and started started singing the chorus. Hey, this is Big Daddy, say whatever it is. Thing. I guess then, well, I'm like, hey, wait, yeah, very well. He's got, you know, he's. He's, he's got his uh, thing, and so he's doing it, and then he's like, all right, let's do it again, let's do a, a harmony to that, and he puts a harmony on, all right, let me do it, and I'll feel above that, and that does a little thing, uh, maybe a counter thing, all right, maybe I'll just like, big daddy say, big daddy say, whatever, he does this little beatles kind of thing in, in that song, and boom, he's like, okay, I gotta go, and it was like, <laughs> and then you're, and you're sitting, and I was sitting, uh, you know, I was producing that record and sitting in the studio with the engineer, and we're like, what just happened? <laughs> like it was a, he was such a, a whirlwind, a, such a big force, and then all of a sudden we're looking at like all these tracks, and he just said like like right across the board, you know, like that, and completely changed the song and made the thing much more special than it would have ever been if it had just been me singing on it. Um, and he did it with n never trying to do what I wanted him to do. He just was himself and just did it in the you know with the Goddamn British slider with those guys. You know? So is that uh, blurred swag? He had he had his blur swag going for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it must be pretty like interesting to see where all these people you work with, where they're where where they are now, like Maya Rudolph and all those people. I mean, of all the people that are like, I've worked with a few people that are just so insanely fast and quick um and he is right at the top but he might not even be the quickest and that and it, he was as quick as i was saying he probably did that whole thing with all these different million different vocal parts and harmonies and counterpoints and all this stuff so like just coming out of him like boom like just uh, like that and uh and i love that i love that about the way that the rentals work that we encourage those moments for people uh, and Petra Hayden is probably yeah. even faster than that. She's like, whatever, <laughs> like a million voices are coming out at once, and it's pretty incredible. And Lucius is like that. Yeah, I mean, we did all of the vocals on, um, 
Austin Alphaville were done in less than two days. Oh my god. Yeah. And so, and they were like, I mean, they were, we were very aware that we had a little time. So I was really prepared for them and they were prepared for me, but they work in, you know, they work in a way that just, it just, you know, it's so fun to be there as long as you're, you know, just to let them go and let them go and let them go. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks so much for your time and uh, let's have fun tonight. Yes, we will, for sure.